Liz's final year of you, and Liz, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Anthony. I'm aware that this is a very auspicious occasion, and I'll attempt to do justice to it today. I'd like to thank you all for being here, and uh, especially the panel members. I would like to start with an acknowledgement of country, um, and the, to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I have my cheat notes in front of me, mainly because, and I said this to Anthony, I plan today to present the findings of my research. But the findings also appear in the voices of the young people and the parents, and a little bit at this point from the service providers. So I've relied quite heavily on their words and their, their voices, their narratives and I don't remember them all. I can tell you who they belong to, but I can't remember them word for word. And uh, so that's why I have my chief notes. I need the pointer. Um, I've done that. So I will, I, I will introduce my findings and I hope to demonstrate that what I've done to date sets me up well to finish by my due date, the 29th of June next year. I will finish by that date. Okay. Very quickly, the aims of the research, a voice for young people, to develop and promote an understanding of the experience of young people when a loved one is missing, to describe the role of parents in responding to young people, to identify and inform best practice in responding to young people and those who support them when a loved one is missing. I talk about loved ones and I talk about missing people and I talk about those left behind because there's not a term, that, as a single word that captures their experience. Again, some quotes, already some quotes. Young people matter too. They are an important part of the family unit and they don't want to be left out. And that was from a service provider. My methodology is a qualitative approach. There are three studies. Two, studies one and two are semi-structured interviews. Study three is an online survey. There are nine missing people related to the 18 participants on this side. The nine missing people were aged between 15 and 61 years at the time they went missing, and they've been missing between two and a half and 43 years. But what is common here is that they all left behind a young person, someone who was up to 20 years of age at the time. So 10 young people form the most important part of this research. Five of them are still young people, that is, they're under 20 years of age. The other five were under 20 years of age at the time their loved one went missing. But now the oldest is probably 50, 56 because she was 13 when her brother went missing and he's been missing for 43 years. 25 service, so eight parents, not necessarily all related to the 10 young people. So some parents were interviewed who are parents of young people, but whose children chose not to participate. Um, 25 service providers responded to the online survey questionnaire. <coughs> Findings, this is really quick because I'm going to touch on them individually. Young people's lives are irrevocably changed when a loved one goes missing. Life is never the same again. Those who come in contact with those left behind, including young people who are left behind when a loved one is missing, need to understand the nature of ambiguous loss. And ambiguity is a key theme that runs through this research, <coughs> that informs this research. No matter our age, our life experience, our level of education or training, we need to be receptive to a view that steps outside the traditionally held view of how grief and loss works. Um, and approaching an, an ambiguous loss challenges us to think about it in a different way, to think about grief and loss in a different way. Living with an ambiguous loss, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about that, becomes a vicious cycle if approached from a solution-focused perspective. And one of the young people says, you can't fix this. And a solution-focused perspective 
focuses on fixing a situation. These people are long-term missing, they remain missing. A long-term missing person is anyone who is missing the officially held Australian Federal Police and State Police definition is missing longer than three months. All involved, family members and service providers need to approach an ambiguous loss from a strengths-based perspective rather than the solution-focused one. People who don't understand the nature of ambiguity may fail to offer support or comfort for those left behind. And I'll come to that in a, in a really poignant quote in a little while. If young people are included, they're more likely to feel supported. They don't need therapy, they just very often need to be included in what's happening. If they are excluded, it contributes to feelings of isolation. Support offered in a timely manner, and I'm talking about reasonably soon after the loved one goes missing. Support that's offered then has a more positive outcome for the young person. For how long? We, we all seek comfort in our lives, and, and those who are left behind want answers, but they also want comfort from the distress they feel. And, and what was evident was that there were people who've had loved ones missing long term who really, I can't think of another word other than they suffered for years um, with the loss that they experienced. Young people need to feel connected with people who get it. And people who get it are those who understand ambiguous loss, who don't place upon them an expectation that they move on, forget, close the door, which is sometimes said to young people. Okay, so again, lots of quotes, and I hope you'll bear with me, but young people's lives are irrevocably changed when a loved one goes missing. And these are the words of the person. I use pseudonyms, and I've said which study they're from, but these are the words of the young person whose brother has been missing for 43 years. It was shattered. It was totally obliterate, obliterated. Life as we know it. All the pieces fragmented and they never fitted together properly again. And that cloak of sadness just sat over everything. We tiptoed around trying not to cause any grief. I guess we didn't know what to do. Feeling powerless to put the pieces back together and powerless to help mum get over the grief to help mum physically. Nothing we did was right. She was 14. Nothing we did was right. Like if you tried to do something to help mum, it was all wrong. So then we ended up not doing anything, not knowing what our roles were, I guess. I tried to look after, and she names the sibling, and she still looks after the sibling. But I could never do that properly. So that was irrevocable change. Those who come in contact with young people need to understand the nature and dynamics of ambiguous loss. And I've used AL, doesn't follow the expected or traditionally held view of the experience of grief and loss. It is not somehow time limited. And if you think about the traditional uh, Kubler-Ross, Beverly Raphael, the, the more traditional uh, staged models, although there's been a move away from that, Ambiguous loss does not fit within those stages, those understandings of grief and loss. It is not time limited because there is often no evidence to suggest what has happened to the missing loved one. It defies resolution and closure. Those left behind do not forget or move on. It's neither measurable nor quantifiable in terms of what the experience looks like. People can report symptoms, they can report impacts, but how you measure that level of distress is impossible. No amount of life experience can, can prepare a person for something like this, and that's the mother of a missing son. Ambiguous loss is a vicious cycle. All we've got in our heads, this is a parent whose daughter has been missing about 35 years, is endless questions that I'll never get answered where, why, when and how. And although the police used to say to me, and they were working really hard, they would say to me, don't they get what's happened? And I would say to them, what has happened? 
their loved one is missing, their loved one is physically absent and remains psychologically present. Um, what would you do if this was your loved one? So what family members do is they, they become quite insistent on receiving information, looking for information. The first young person I quote, Tara, talks about her parents relentlessly searching. Um, at least with the death, time does make some difference. It's much easier to accept over time, but this no. And this is a woman who's lived with this, as I've said, for over 30 years. In winter time, we think, are they cold? I go to bed in winter time and I think, oh, it's freezing out there. Is she out there? Is she on the street? Is she warm? Is she cold? Mother's Day, does she have children? And people talk about events, young people and adults talk about events that trigger, don't make them remember, but trigger the memories afresh, if you like. We all feel these things. She knows that because she's connected with others who do. People who don't understand the nature of ambiguity may fail to offer support or comfort for those left behind. And this, I think, is particularly poignant. This girl was 13. Her father has been missing for about 35 years. We didn't come into, I didn't come into contact with her until a little while before the research, because of my place of work. And it was the first time she had ever spoken to anybody other than family about what was happening. We were talking about, she's 13, how good it would be for him to buy me a horse when he came back. My friend said to me, what if he doesn't come back because they hadn't heard from him for a few days? I'm aware of confidentiality as well, because if I talk about the specific circumstances, she is identified or her father is identified. Bible. They were sitting on a fence and at that time a police car drove past. She said, I ran home and they were in my driveway and I went in and they were talking to my mother. Two weeks after that visit, there was a memorial service. A memorial service is for somebody who's died. They had no proof that he was dead. I was standing beside my mother and I started to cry. So she got one of the people walking past and asked me to take asked them to take me home. We never spoke about him again. Being allowed to not know, that's something we weren't, my brother and I weren't allowed to do. We were told after two weeks, after he'd been missing for two weeks, that's it, he's dead. I asked my mother, years later, why she never supported me. And she said, it never occurred to me that you needed support. And it wasn't that her mother didn't love her, it had not ever actually dawned on her mother that this 13 year old, who when I met her was 43, needed to talk about her father, needed to remember her father. So a finding is that people need to be, young people <coughs> need to be a part of what is happening. They need to be allowed to remember. Dialectical thinking, being able to hold two opposing views. It's okay to not know. Um, if, if, young, if young people and if adults are able to think dialectically, that is both here and gone. Psychologically <coughs> present and physically absent, there is a sense of relief for them. <coughs> this is the same young person who was sitting on the fence I haven't understood my whole life. She said this both in the research and she had said it to me previously. What you do when you don't know. I read Ambiguous Loss and it's a paperback written by the person who first developed, the psychologist in the States who first developed the concept of ambiguous loss. Um, Pauline Boss, it was excellent because of the simple thing that you don't have to know. You don't have to reach a conclusion, closure, resolution. You can hold on to not knowing, not in a sense of denial, but that it's okay to not know. It's okay to think, okay, there's a 99.99% .99 chance that my father is dead and I'll never see him again. But it's okay to think, I don't know that for sure. 
So you never know, it's possible, because we don't know one way or another. It's funny how something so simple can be such a relief, just to know it's okay to not know. Just to give yourself permission to hold a candle or to think, well, I actually don't know for sure. The second one is Eliza. When I think of Noel, the pseudonym for her brother, I can't help but smile because he was such a funny dude. She actually uses alliteration there, but she uses, she describes him as a dude. I actually took out, yeah. if you know what alliteration is, I took out mm -hmm. the alliterative noun. Um, he was the funniest dude I've ever met, and that's the thing. I'd much rather have had him and his influence on me and my life than to have not had him at all. When I spoke with Eliza, her brother had been missing for about 14 years. You know, to go through this pain, I wouldn't have it any other way. If it's between having him, hands down, having him as long as I did. It, a finding, if young people are included, they feel supported. If they're excluded, they feel isolated. Inclusion, and sometimes support from unexpected places, because sometimes the support didn't come from the expected places. We were always just around the table together. It wasn't contrived. Uh, Megan talks about, I was sometimes in the kitchen making cups of tea. Sometimes I was out at the movies. She was being a young person, but she was a part of the discussion, part of what was happening. <coughs> Eliza, I learned so much about my parents in terms of what awesome people they are. And her father, is a person who has a voice within the missing person sector as well. And that's his way of finding me. I mean my respect for them sticking together and coping and being there for me as much as they could without topping themselves. I thought that was pretty great. Um, exclusion. By those from whom support was expected. This is again Margot, whose story really is tragic but, but Margot is now in a different place, having found support, and we'll come to that. There wasn't really anyone to do it to. Nobody at school knew. I eventually told one other girl whose father had died, and she got really upset when I told her. So I didn't speak to her about it again. My mother didn't tell anyone at school. I never had counselling. None of the teachers spoke to me. There was nothing like that. Support for young people is accessed in a variety of ways and at different times. And I'm not talking about psychological intervention. I'm talking about a range of supports. Access to information and support, being told, being told in a timely manner. My grandmother, so this is Tara, whose <coughs> mother at 14, when she tried to be hugged, her mother said, you're too big for that. And she's the one who said, we tried to help. We tried to help her through her grief. We didn't know what to do. My grandmother was an absolutely wonderful woman. She communicated everything. I think she was trying to keep us informed. She gave us information when our parents couldn't. Dad was the main one. He kept me posted. My impression was that initially there was nothing we could really do. Once again, feelings of helplessness. I didn't drop out of uni to come and be with them during this time, so she was 19 turning 20. But I'm pretty sure I was calling them every day. They were 120 kilometres away. Indirect, sort of accident, again accidental. Dad was frustrated with the lack of support, and I guess I never really believed they were doing much. And that, that again is those feelings of helplessness and powerlessness. That was my impression by Dad. Until he met a constable, he felt would really listen and seriously hear him. And that was important, to know that a service provider was taking an interest. I was just glad that Dad was feeling listened to because I felt like for Dad it was hitting his head up against a brick wall. And that was just exacerbating the turmoil that, was he, that he was in. Young people were very mindful of wanting to know, but of watching their parents and watching the adults around them to see how they were dealing with what was happening. Accidental and unexpected later in life. It was the first time I met her. She's talking about her grandmother. Uh, I say that, missing father's family. 
She met her more than 30 years after the event, after her father had gone missing, because they lived in the US, the parents were separated, and so there was family disconnection. She'd never met her paternal grandparents. The thing that really got me, and this is the one, the young woman who says, we never spoke about him again at home where she lived. The thing that really got me was that when I went over there, they all spoke about him all the time. They had pictures of him up in their house, and she had a painting of him. And at the dinner table, they would sit there, and even the younger generation would talk about him. She now does that with her own children. Not in, a, in, a, in an acknowledgement of his life. Oh, the one who's living on the desert island somewhere, that's not denial. It's an alternate view. Um, so he was part of their lives. He went missing sailing, so that was the issue. So he was part of their lives and their discussions. It really stood out for me because he hadn't been part of mine. So young people need permission to remember and to acknowledge, to make memories. Not fanciful memories, but to be able to remember the missing person. I wasn't like depressed, like sitting in my room, cut off. I didn't need to be like fixed or whatever. This is the youngest male participant. It was more just, I guess, it aided with talking and getting through the situation. So, you know, being able to talk to somebody that was removed from the situation, that was helpful. I could just tell them what I was thinking about it and we just chatted. This was support through school, but it was the year advisor checking in. Um, no opinionated responses. And one of the things that happens is that everybody, when a loss is ambiguous, tends to have an opinion, tends to speculate. Neither adults nor children want that. Finding resilience and making meaning. How I was in the family for the rest of it, I still went through a lot of the emotions. I understood them all and I sort of dealt with it a bit quicker than a lot of the others. He attended a support group. It just kind of helped me understand what they were going through and it helped me deal with other problems. The understanding I got from this issue was pretty deep. He talks about developing an empathy for other people and helps me out a lot with dealing with not only the family but all the other problems at my age. A time of great change, adolescence. I thought that was useful. About connecting with others. Finally, young people still want to be young people. It's a bit of, is that a truism? But it is, they still want to be able to be a part of what's going on outside of living with the loss of a missing person. Um, I facilitated with my team prior to this research, I facilitated a, a support group meeting for young people and it turned out that it was the first support group meeting for young people in the world. We didn't know it at the time. Um, so it was, it was wonderful to have these young people come along and to share their experiences. And the photo back a bit was given with their permission and that was them sitting outside and one of them's holding a soccer ball. And in between talking to us about really serious things, they played and they drew and they talked with each other and they didn't even get on all of the time. But we sought feedback from them along the way, and this is about young people being allowed to be young people. And our feedback was, we hoped it was going to help us deliver a bigger and better program or a more meaningful program. And one of the pieces of feedback they gave us was they wanted chips and gravy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And so it was about being human, being, being a young person. Timely recognition, inclusion and support for young people within their families and community results in lowering, lower ongoing levels of distress. There's still distress, but, it, but it's not carried the way a couple of the older participants carried that for decades. When the impact of the loss of the missing loved one on the young person is not recognised, young people are not offered support. The mother who said, never occurred to me that you needed support. The ongoing impact of trauma, grief and loss is greater and of longer duration. There is a need for improved health literacy. People need to understand ambiguous loss, specifically ambiguous loss literacy. 
It is only with this enhanced understanding that those who are faced with the loss of a missing person will be approached with compassion, understanding and, some, and support in their struggles. I met people who were told they were obsessed with wanting to know and they were often told that by service providers. And what that indicated to me was not that the, the service provider didn't care or wasn't working hard, but that the service provider didn't understand the dynamics of ambiguous loss. So a need, as I say, for increased literacy, ambiguous loss literacy. Where to from here? My submission date is the 29th of June 2020. I have more writing to do. Um, I want to continue to expand and develop the findings. I plan to, and I have some recommendations, but to develop recommendations, um, when I say expand and develop the findings, the writing of the findings, develop recommendations for best practice and service delivery in the missing person sector and where ambiguous loss occurs is if people come in contact with those who've experienced it because it's not just the service providers were um, out of home care workers, child protection workers, um, foster carers. So there were lots of different places, people not working in the missing person sector but coming into contact with young people who'd experienced ambiguous loss. My findings will involve, will include recommendations for raising awareness of the missing persons phenomenon. Because we really, and, and certainly until I worked in the area, and I had been a social worker for decades, until I worked in the area, I didn't. I understood there was a struggle. I didn't quite understand the dynamics of that struggle. Psychoeducation and training for both service providers and those left behind, so young people and parents. Parents need to understand that they are able to support their young person. Service providers are able to support young people without having a psychology degree, a social work degree, um, because it's about being present and being connected. And finally, guidelines for working with young people. Oh, and I thought I had a thank you slide. <laughs> I would like to say thank you. And, and that is my presentation for today. So I'll open up for some questions. It took me a moment, or it took me a few slides to figure out what missing, uh, what missing meant. Right. And what, uh, eventually I got it. But then, also, there's, it would seem to me that the experience and guidelines and so forth for a missing child and a missing parent would be totally different. I, you didn't make that, you, you didn't highlight that distinction in your presentation. When you're talking about, when you're talking about how you, psycho, you present psychoeducation in terms of who is missing, is mm -hmm. that, yeah. I think ambiguous loss applies, whether the... No, 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 I, I, I understand that there are certain aspects of it that were generalized, whether yep. it was the parent who went missing or the child who went missing. Uh, but yes. some of them would be, surely would be totally different. I think anything that's delivered has to be age appropriate, but I think the impact is, is very similar. I guess because my focus is young people, I didn't in the study involve any young people where the, uh, the missing person was somebody who was younger than they were. That was more a, by coincidence, by chance, mm -hmm. than by design. Um, but the youngest missing person was 15 years old and the person related to her was 14 at the time. So yes, mm -hmm. anything that's delivered has to be age appropriate, but I think while the context of it is important, the dynamics are very similar. Okay. Just to go on a little bit more from Herb's position too, I noticed as you were doing it, sort of uh, provided the narrative that you also embedded it in, in the context of how it happened, how the actual missing occurred. You know, it was a sailing accident or it was 
you know, something mm. like that. Mm. I suppose in a sense I, I had the feeling that understanding the context of when the missing occurred might have had some meaning. Can you tell me what you think about um, that? I, t I do talk about that more in the, in the research. I, th I think the thing about the context is very important but what's more important is the meaning that's made of it. Mm -hmm. So there were young people whose missing loved one had gone missing for no clear reason. Mm -hmm. And even for the one where he was sailing and missing offshore, there was no boat. There was no... No wreckage found. No wreckage no. found. So, so I guess what what emerged, regardless of the circumstances of going missing, and I did have another in another slide, and I took it out. Some went missing from home, mm. but finding out they were missing was ambiguous in itself. Because one young person talked about, Mum rang me and said Dad had been around, and the door was open, and that was all we knew. Mm. Um, so, so the circumstances surrounding missing were very ambiguous. It was not like seeing somebody bundled into a car. Mm. They, there was not information that may have pointed towards somebody else being involved. purely inductive because I brought with me my knowledge and experience of having worked in the missing persons sector when I started for about six years and in the end for nearly a decade. So predominantly an inductive methodology, an inductive approach. Ambiguous loss theory underpins it all um, and that notion of not having to know, not having the dynamics of ambiguous loss inform the way I approached young people. Um, I sought their narratives. While I had I used semi-structured interviews, very often I started with an opening statement that was the same for everybody, and it was about, I want to hear about your experience of learning about, living with, and very often off they went. So, so semi-structured interviews, but, but very much with, if the narrative unfolded, that was what we went with. Um, and so young people were, were really, and parents were really happy to do that. Because often it was about, giving, in giving them a voice, it was often the first time <laughs> they told the story from beginning to end. Can I ask about the latter parts of your study, which was the survey? Have mm -hmm. you completed the survey? I have completed it, and there's not much reference to it there. Yes. Can you tell us about a little bit about mm -hmm. the findings? Oh, all? yes. Well, the findings are that the people who responded to the survey recognised the need to include young people. Oh. And this is difficult because I will talk with Anthony and I'll talk with Janet about this. Because what I can deduce from that is if you don't recognise the situation for young people, if you don't recognise that there's a need for support, you, as a service provider, you very often don't become involved in asking about what's happening for young people. So the need, the fact that people recognised there was value in completing the survey told me that they recognised that young people were an important part of what happens mm -hmm. after a loved one goes missing. Those who responded were, were often employed in a support role 
in a, if you like, working from a strengths-based perspective. Those who worked from a solution-focused perspective, um, like investigators, I have no evidence that, although we worked, in my work I worked quite closely with police, I have no evidence that police actually responded to the survey. And I think part of that is because if you're a solution-focused person, it's a bit like, well, this person's been missing long term, don't they get that, that don't, as in does the family not get that they're not coming back? Mm -hmm. And it's closed, it's over. Yes, yes, yes. 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 They, 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 need, they need to find closure, <laughs> they need to find, and we sometimes receive referrals, mm. which, which leads me to make that statement, because it would be, can't you do something with these people, they keep ringing us. And that was my comment about, I'd ring you too, mm -hmm. if this was my loved one. Mm -hmm. um, because families are in a really desperate situation. And there has been research around people seeking information and the, and the whole idea of the impact of hearing, there's no news today. Mm -hmm. Or hearing, no news at all. Okay. Mm. You know when you present the narratives too, just to, to keep going with that, is this I'm sort of getting this connection all the time, even as you talk. You know, when you're writing who presents, who is the voice, you're using a pseudonym for the voice. But is it worth it to connect it to the missing as well? So it's, there's a, a scenario about the missing person that connects the material? I did that in Chapter 5. Okay. I introduced... Um, the family groupings, yeah. if you like. But even that's a bit of a challenge because yeah. one of the things that happens when somebody goes missing is that sometimes people stop talking to other people mm -hmm. and there's silence and there's a, there can be disconnection. Mm -hmm. So I, as I said, there were nine missing people related to 18 participants. Mm -hmm. But in some instances, they were very close and, and emotionally connected and in others there was some estrangement that had occurred so I had to be a little bit mm. I obviously couldn't wouldn't spell that out mm. Um, mm. and that was a bit difficult I still introduced them together um, yeah. complex relationships mm. Mm. Uh, Liz, um, from the data you have got so far yes can you identify which kind of perception would be more traumatic and more devastating than some other. In it's terms of like, the, the... Like shock, guilt, oh. sadness... Well, I think, it, I, I mean, ambiguous loss, when someone goes missing, it's still an experience of grief. It's also an experience of trauma. So I do, I do mention that. I mean, it is literally shock, disbelief, sadness, emotional distress. All of those, if you like, trauma symptoms trauma and grief system symptoms are evident. I talk about feelings of helplessness and hopelessness. In an ongoing way, when support wasn't as available, one of the things that emerges quite strongly is anxiety. Um, and that for some of the older participants, there were very high levels of anxiety around which they made meaning when they understood better their experience of ambiguous loss. So the person who says, I haven't understood my whole life, a crisis point arrived at, a, at late in her life, when she was turning 40, and her children were the same age as she was when her father went missing. What she realised was her anxiety was incredible and she had a hospital admission and she said, I thought I was dying and in fact it was anxiety in, a, in its most extreme form and she said, I got out of hospital, all I wanted to do was get out and she said, what scared me most was leaving my children and again I have to be really mindful of confidentiality of leaving my children with somebody who didn't care about as I felt I was left 
when my father went missing with somebody who didn't care about me. So there was her sadness and her distress, but her anxiety escalated to a point, and she was the one who then read Ambiguous Lost and said, I don't need to know. Um, she was a highly capable woman um, and, and supporting her children beautifully, but her anxiety escalated over a period of about 30 years. She also, a friend described her one day, she talked about trying to be invisible. And, and so that was about embarrassment and shame. Grief and loss, sadness are the most important early impacts and shock, disbelief. But she talked about, I tried to be invisible. I didn't want anybody at school to see me upset. And she would literally sit, she said there was an alcove and I would sit next to the alcove so people couldn't see me upset. And she said, then I decided I could be happy or I could be sad for the rest of my life. So I decided I was going to be happy until the day a friend's brother said to me, why are you terminally happy? Mm. And she realised the ongoing impact. Yeah, I just thought that... So is there a dominant symptom? No, they're very much trauma symptoms and their grief and loss or signs, effects thereof. But a dominant one, sure. I thought, I, I thought at a certain stage, like, you know, as things change, yeah. you know, the person's perceptions will change as well. And yes. my point is, if you could identify at a certain stage, this is the most yes. dramatic, this is the most yes. uh, devastating, perception, then we are in a better position to help these people at that particular stage. I think the interesting statement in that is that there are not stages. People just move forward and do the best they can to cope with what is happening. So it's not, as I said, it doesn't fit the traditional view of grief and loss, the staged models that talk about shock, disbelief, anger, um, whatever the next one is, and acceptance or resolution. It, missing doesn't fit those, those staged models. So it's neither time limited nor predictable, if you like. What is predictable is that people struggle emotionally. They struggle to understand. And I think the one thing they all do is they look to find comfort. They want their missing loved one found, and really they never quite give up on that, although some talk about a stage of acceptance that perhaps their loved one will never be found, either dead or alive. But what they all struggle for, if their loved one can't be found, is some relief from the distress they feel. And they found relief by connecting with others by understanding better, by giving themselves permission to not know, um, by reducing, by having their isolation reduced, by coming together with others. Can I just ask another question, yes. please? Um, um, you've obviously drawn a lot on your work experience. You're very knowledgeable in this field of practice. How did you through this research, navigate the distinction between yourself as a practitioner um, in the organisation that works with the same group of people and yourself as a researcher, and what you were gathering that was actually research findings versus what you knew through your practice wisdom of having worked in the Right. Where I... Um, mention or refer to anything that is about my experience, I call it that. Um, it was not difficult. Most of the people I had met previously, but not all of them, and it didn't seem to make a difference. It was it in terms of how they were able to narrate their story. They I felt that it was, as I said, it was not difficult to go in there as a researcher and to say to them, you know me as this, but I'm here for this reason. And so it was in some ways quite a formal process in the introduction of the research. Um, it, it was not 
diff it needed to be clear but it wasn't difficult to navigate. If something something that was made very clear was that if for the the participants something arose during the course of the research, there was already backup support in place from other members of the team that I manage, but also externally. So they knew that if there was something that was concerning them, there was somewhere they could take that that wasn't to me. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Liz. Um, we were, we're very impressed with that. We're going to have a discussion, so can we just join in? Thank you. Thank you.